Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. Um, it's May the 17th and we're continuing our readings from yesterday. The disciples um, were let go. They were released from arrest by the religious leaders and they went on their way to their own people and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when the whole church heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who has made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is, and who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? You see, the whole church suddenly the whole of Old Testament now was coming by the Holy Spirit into full focus and every Old Testament passage was fitting into place. It was just slotting into place. They were beginning, their eyes were being opened by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will uh, bring all things to your remembrance and he will open your eyes to all truth. Um, and this is exactly what's happening now. <clears throat> and they say, because of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things I want to point out to you. Now, these are what I call the glory days. These are the glory days. The church now doesn't number 120. The church is numbered in its thousands now. And in the prayer that they bring, they quote David in the Psalms and they, they describe what's happened um, as being something that thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Now they're not saying that it was God's plan that uh, the religious leaders and upon Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles would be gathered together against Christ. What they're saying is that what happened to Christ was foreseen. God already knew that this was going to happen. Um, the Lord can see um, events of the future and that's why it was foretold. Now, what is it that they actually pray? Do they pray that the opposition will go away? Well, no, they don't. That's quite unrealistic to pray for that. Do they pray that these people will die? Pontius Pilate will die and Herod will die and, and the Gentiles will die? No, 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 far from it. <clears throat> What they pray for is this. They pray that the Lord will grant to his servants boldness to speak the word. And that the Lord would stretch forth his hand, his hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. So there's two things here. First of all, they're asking the Lord that the preachers of the word will have the boldness and they will have the courage to continue to speak the word of the Lord. And they also ask <coughs> that the Lord Jesus himself will give healings and signs and wonders so that the unbelievers will be convinced. Now, not that they'll be convinced to become Christians, but they will become convinced okay, of the message that is declared. Of course, 
um, the signs and wonders were given to an unbelievers. They were not given for believers. They're given to unbelievers and they're given to unbelievers as a sign from God of the certainty of the judgment that is coming. Now, <clears throat> very often in this passage, we have the word and added in. Um, and what I want to say about that little word is that that doesn't mean that the event that occurs next automatically occurs at the same time or immediately after the same time. <clears throat> I think that the last part of verse 31, it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I think that we must understand that when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. That's one thing. But when they then came out of that place of prayer, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and that enabled them to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, the Holy Spirit was already in the heart of every one of them. <clears throat> but their ministry is characterised by the filling of the Holy Spirit. But it is their ministry that's characterised by that. And because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were then able to preach with the word of God with boldness. So the filling of the Holy Spirit was for the purpose of service. And that's always the case as we go right through this book. We're going to find that that's always going to be the case. Um, then we come to verse 32. <clears throat> Notice what it says. By the way, that's my password, verse 31. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, in verse 32, we have the next description of them. It says the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Now, <clears throat> neither said any of them that aught of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And the, um, the believers were united. This is why I say they were the glory days. This is when they were united in heart and united in soul. So not only did, because the heart is the seat of the thinking man, and so not only were they united in mind, but they were united in soul. They were united as human beings in soul. Neither of them said that the things that they had were their own, but they had all things in common. So they did not look upon their personal possessions as something to be grasped after and hung on to. No, no. They released their possession of their own possessions and they considered them all to be something that belonged to all of them. <clears throat> now, what was the result of that? Verse 33, it says, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So the result of this attitude this res the result of the attitude of oneness and of unity of heart and soul was that they had great power. You see, the great power of the apostles. It was the apostles primarily that were the witnesses. And what did they witness to? And they didn't primarily witness to the cross. <clears throat> That's not what Luke says. They didn't witness primarily to the life of Christ. They witnessed to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because the resurrection <clears throat> is the confirmation that this sacrifice of the Lord Jesus was accepted. And it is the proof that the life of the Lord Jesus was righteous before God. <clears throat> so the resurrection was the focus. It was the resurrection that was denied by the religious leaders. And so it is the resurrection that is the main point that is preached. Um, when Paul later is speaking about the resurrection in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, he's speaking there about the Jews in their unique position before God in the present age. And he says, if you Jews believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, then 
you shall be saved. So this was a crucial issue for the Jews. The resurrection was a great stumbling block for them. <clears throat> now, in verse 34, it says, neither was there any among them that lacked. You say, how's that possible? This was a society of extremes. There was very poor people, but there were also very rich people. It's difficult for us today to imagine that quite, but the, but the society of Israel, though it was a benevolent society and there was opportunity for the poor, um, the main thing is that there was um, extremes. Um, and so what did the believers do? Well, if they had wealth, they sold surplus wealth uh, that they might bring the, uh, the, the, the cost of the homes that they had and they brought the, the, the cost of the money that was collected and they put it at the apostles' feet and this money was then distributed amongst the poor believers according to their need. And uh, Luke gives us an example of Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. So Barnabas, which being interpreted means son of consolation, Barnabas, he was a Levite, he was of the country of Cyprus, and he had land. Uh, presumably it wasn't land in Cyprus because he wouldn't have been able to sell it that quickly. It was a long way to Cyprus. But he had some land that he obviously didn't need. So he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. What a wonderful thing that Barnabas did. What a wonderful thing. He must have stood there with a big smile on his face when he realised that God had given him land which could be sold to feed the poor. Well, God bless you. It's great to talk to you. Look forward to speaking to you again tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye for now.